So you may remember my review of the GM32FQ, where honestly, I came away feeling incredibly underwhelmed by Cooler Master's 1440p gaming monitor. Well, today the company is back and they have gone big, as we are checking out a 34 inch ultra wide, which is actually the successor to Cooler Master's first ever gaming monitor. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and today we are checking out the Cooler Master GM34 CWQ ARGB. Now, if that name sounds familiar to you, it's probably because Cooler Master's first ever gaming monitor was called the GM34 CW. But almost two years on, the company has refreshed their ultra wide offering, and today we're going to put it through its paces. To go over the key specs of this new model then, it's a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 display using a VA panel with quantum dot technology. It offers a 144Hz refresh rate and if you haven't noticed yet, it is curved with a 1500R curvature rating. It's also attractively priced with an MSRP of £419.99 here in the UK. Kicking this review off though with a look at the design, there is honestly a lot to like here with the GM34 CWQ ARGB. First of all, we can see nice and slim inset bezels and there's just a smallish chin at the bottom. The back of the screen is fairly nondescript as well with just some glossy pieces of plastic used to break things up a bit. Do note though that there is actually no lighting on the back of the screen unlike the original model. There is, however, RGB lighting in the base of the stand, and you can control this using Cooler Master's Master Plus software. Honestly, I do think this looks pretty good, though personally, I would leave it off when gaming, but if you like this sort of thing, then it is an option. The only real downside here is that you actually need to connect a micro USB cable into the stand itself to power the lighting as the base of the stand is removable so it doesn't get any power from the rest of the monitor. I wouldn't say that this was the end of the world though, it is a little bit of a faff and it's another cable to contend with. I do really like the metal stand that Cooler Master is using though, it feels really solid and definitely adds a premium touch to the design. It also offers a decent selection of ergonomic adjustments, with height adjust up to 80mm, 15 degrees of swivel in both directions, and we also get tilt from 5 degrees downwards to 15 degrees upwards. The only thing I'm not convinced about from that selection is the height adjust, where we only get up to 80mm. I'm 5 foot 11 and during my use I definitely found myself wanting just a little bit more height, so if you are on the taller side, that could be something to consider. As for the connectivity options then, here we can find two HDMI 2.0 ports, there's one DisplayPort 1.4, as well as a USB Type-C that can supply 65 watts power delivery. The USB Type-B upstream port that you can see here actually feeds two USB Type-A ports which are positioned on the left edge of the display. Also in the bottom right on the back of the display, we can find a small joystick used to navigate the OSD. For me, this is a fantastic inclusion as I really was quite critical of the GM32FQ as that only had small fiddly buttons to navigate the OSD, but it is good to see Cooler Master has made the right decision this time around. The OSD itself though hasn't changed a whole lot and in my opinion, it still looks and feels quite clunky and out of date compared to other gaming monitors. One of my previous criticisms has at least been partially addressed as the overdrive settings have now been moved into the setup menu tab, so you don't have to drill down into the picture mode settings anymore, which always felt just a bit unnecessary to me. I also don't want to be too critical here, as generally speaking, navigating the OSD is straightforward thanks to that joystick. It is still a bit strange to me, however, that when you actually have the OSD open, Cooler Master decided that clicking in the joystick will actually close the OSD instead of selecting whichever setting you are looking at. That just feels unintuitive to me and definitely took some getting used to. <music> the 
That is going to do it for our look at the design of the display though, so let's move on to talk about panel performance, starting off with our Spider X testing. Straight away here, we can see a wide color gamut in place, with 100% sRGB reporting and then 92% Adobe RGB and 95% DCI P3 coverage. The Quantum Dot technology definitely helps here, giving the panel a punchy and saturated appearance. Brightness levels are also impressive as we hit 423 nits, when Cooler Master actually claims a peak of 400 nits. We couldn't quite hit the claimed 4000 to 1 contrast ratio however, as we saw a maximum of 3470 to 1, but this is still a very good result and this aspect of the panel was immediately noticeable to me after switching from an IPS screen. Out of the box colour accuracy is also impressive for a VA panel at this price point. We have seen better results from similarly priced IPS displays, but even then the average delta E of just 1.06 is still great to see, while a maximum of 1.86 is arguably even more impressive. We did manage to improve this further after calibration, with a new average delta E of 0.74, but unless you're doing some real colour sensitive work, then I'd say this screen looks absolutely fantastic out of the box. As for gaming then, here we have to start with the response times, where we're using the open source response time tool as developed by Tech Team GB. The GM34CWQ has four different overdrive modes, plus overdrive off, and we're going to test all of those modes at 144Hz. Starting with overdrive turned off then, here we can see some honestly very slow response times, with an average grey to grey figure of 13.73 milliseconds. There are some particularly slow rise times from dark shades as well, which you can see on the top row of the heat map, and that does indicate some dark level smearing, which is fairly common with VA panels. Switching to the normal overdrive mode does yield better results, with a number of transitions now speeding up, so we get a new average of 9.14 milliseconds. This mode doesn't do too much to improve the very slow rise times, however, and we can see that only 47% of transitions fall within the 144Hz window, which is not exactly fantastic. Next, we have the advanced overdrive mode, and this is the one I ended up using. It does introduce a bit too much overshoot for my liking, but it also speeds up a number of transitions, and for me, this mode gave the best balance. 67% of transitions are now within the 144Hz refresh window too, which is better, but still not fantastic. We can also see that transitions from RGB0 to RGB51 and then 102 are still painfully slow, translating as dark level smearing in the real world. We did also test the ultra fast overdrive mode, but honestly, this is just not worth your time. Average grey to grey transitions did drop below 5 milliseconds, but we can also see a huge 60% of transitions overshot their target by more than 15%, so in my opinion this mode is just not worth using. The same can also be said for the dynamic overdrive mode, which actually ended up using the ultra fast mode at 144Hz, which in my opinion was the worst of the lot, so I can't recommend using the dynamic mode either. Overall then, I would say the two most usable overdrive modes are going to be normal or advanced. Normal did have absolutely minimal overshoot, though the response times were still fairly slow. And then we have advanced, which definitely sped things up a bit, but at the cost of overshoot, though admittedly this didn't bother me that much while gaming. Looking at the advanced overdrive mode then, as we can see from this chart, it's still a pretty middling response time overall. It is however a touch faster than the similarly priced Iyama GB3466WQSU, although the Iyama does have less overshoot as well. What this means for gaming then is that games do feel fluid enough, but you're not getting the smoothest of experiences, and I did notice a bit of blurring here and there, with dark level smearing being evident as well. For most people, I still think it will be absolutely fine, and we do also need to remember the relatively low price point as part of this discussion. Still, when playing Dying Light 2 for instance, there is no getting around the slightly blurry presentation which definitely can be distracting, especially if you are used to a faster IPS panel.
Putting speed to one side though, I do have to say that the colours and overall vibrancy of the panel are absolutely fantastic. No doubt thanks to the Quantum Dot technology. I fired up a bit of LEGO Builder's Journey where the response times become basically meaningless and it just looked terrific, with rich colours and strong contrast from the VA panel. Even when switching back to the GB3466 for some of my testing, the colours just can't compete with the GM34CWQ. Latency is also no problem for the GM34CWQ, with an average figure of 11.8 milliseconds. That actually means the Cooler Master monitor is almost twice as fast as the Iyama GB3466 in terms of latency, though I'd say that's more a case of the Iyama monitor being particularly slow than it is for the GM34CWQ being particularly fast. I also want to touch on G-Sync support, as we only find FreeSync Premium certification here, so NVIDIA hasn't officially certified this screen to work with G-Sync. I was able to enable it through the NVIDIA control panel however, and while it did flick it a couple of times immediately after I enabled G-Sync, after that it seemed absolutely fine to me and I didn't notice any flicker in game, so if you do have an NVIDIA GPU, I'd say you are good to go. It's also worth touching on viewing angles which are pretty decent for a VA panel. Colours do get washed out if you move too far away from the centre of the screen, but it's a curved display so I can't really see how you are going to use this without being dead centre, so to me that's no problem. Backlight bleed is also no real problem. There are a couple of areas in each corner where we do get a little bit of leakage, but for an ultra wide display I have definitely seen much worse. The last area I want to touch on then is going to be HDR, but this is only display HDR 400 certification, so we don't get any local dimming and it's not exactly an eye searing peak brightness. You will get more contrast from this panel compared to an IPS display with the same HDR certification, but I'd still say that your content and games is going to look better in SDR mode, so I would ignore the HDR capabilities. Overall then, for £420, the Cooler Master GM34CWQ ARGB is definitely a good option to have. Its pricing does put it towards the entry-level ultra-wide space, though there are still a few models that are even cheaper, including the Iyama GB3466 WQSU. That said, Cooler Master definitely has the upper hand in a few key areas to justify the extra cost. The Quantum Dot technology, for instance, really comes to the fore and makes an impressive difference in terms of overall colour saturation and vibrancy, while I'd also say that the design and metal stand definitely add more of a premium feel. The main drawback to the GM34CWQ really does come down to its pretty average response times, which are honestly not much faster at all compared to the Iyama GB3466. Considering that Iyama panel is almost two years old at this point, I really was hoping for a bit more from this Cooler Master monitor. Even taking that into account though, if you want a good looking ultra wide display at a reasonable price point, Cooler Master has definitely put its name into the mix. It is just safe to say there is still room for improvement. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this review. So if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up and let me know your thoughts on this display down in the comments below. You can also subscribe if you haven't already and ding that notification bell so you won't miss any of our uploads. You can also find a link to our Discord server in the description where we'd love to hear from you guys. And while you're there, you can also check out a link to our merch store. And if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That is going to do it for this review though, guys. I'm Dominic Forkit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.